Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. This is a Ukraine War Update Extra video giving you extra tidbits uh, and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. I'm going to do a bit of an odd one tonight, which is uh, I'm going to talk to you. I had a bit of an idea last night when I did the live stream interview with Anastasia Pereskevova. I don't know if I've butchered that. I always seem to. Uh, and she's a really interesting interview. She is from Kharkiv. And we talked about all manner of things. And we did one question did talk about Stefan Bandera, uh, who is quite a divisive figure in Ukrainian history. And you find a lot of Russians, and that's, you know, from the Kremlin to propagandists, to Russian voices on my threads and people you come across on the internet. We'll use this guy uh, and call people things like Banderites, Nazis, and then with that, they will, they will call people that want Ukraine to remain or, yeah, to remain as a, a national entity, uh, to have Ukrainian I identity. They'll call them Nazis, Ukro-Nazis, Banderites as well. And there's this really big problem in a discourse with Russian people and particularly, well, all sorts of Russians, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Kremlin propagandists, people who are arguing on the internet, bots, whatever, that basically anyone who is arguing against their position, which is some kind of weird Russian imperialism mixed with Soviet Union uh, rose-tinted glasses mythology, Anyone who's arguing against that is by default Nazis. There's this false dichotomy of, you know, Russia and Nazism. or and, and Russia, as I say, can be anything from the old Soviet Union to whatever it is now, which I would argue is some form of fascistic uh, ideology that is approaching Nazism, right? So, so, so you've got this really weird situation. But if we're going to see things on a kind of, on a linear political line, uh, on a linear political uh, continuum, which I think is problematic. I'd much rather see uh, a quadrant like the political compass. But we are going to sort of use this simplistic um, metric. Then it's easy to understand how, it w how in this case, it, if you're not us, you are them. And they jump from one end of the line to the other. But actually their end of the line, as I argue, is actually the end of the line that they're claiming other people are at for many of these people, or it's old school communism. But anyway, part of what I want to say, and I'm no great historian here, you know, I don't know much about Bandera myself, so I'm just going to dip into two sources, Wikipedia, just for your, your basics. But I'm going to go to Timothy Snyder, the historian uh, and expert on Eastern Europe, Ukraine and Russia, uh, for a, for a little bit of an overview, uh, but I want to just talk about this this idea of simplifying very complex ideas and people. In this case, uh, seeing Bandera as this Nazi, basically he is a Nazi, whereas I would argue he was fascistic, but he was someone that that saw Nazi Germany as the enemy of so the Soviet Union and the enemy of my enemy is my friend type thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that he was a Nazi himself, but he, there was an awful lot of overlap. But it but it, it's also this more complex scenario where he what he really wanted was a he was a staunch ultra nationalist, right? So he wanted an independent Ukraine. So therefore if people now want an in independent Ukraine, independent of the Soviet Union, that's that's largely what a lot of well almost all Ukrainians want then you can see that there might be ways that they might see Bandera as if not a hero then there were elements of what he was fighting for you know if what he was fighting for is what I'm fighting for then there's going to be a commonality there even though he's a deeply flawed uh, political moral figure so th things are just complicated I guess the, the end result of what I'm trying to say is history and reality is complicated it is not black and white is too simplistic there is everyone has you know gray to them uh or everything has gray every situation is far more nuanced than we we often give credit for so anyway 
Wikipedia, just to go into it, just really simply, uh, he was a highly controversial figure in Ukraine, as it says here. Many Ukrainians hail him as a role model hero, as a martyred liberation fighter, while other Ukrainians, particularly the South and the East, and this was a question that came up in the interview I did last night to uh, Anastasia saying, do you find that the, the support for Bandera drops off as you go further east and indeed south? Uh, really good question. Uh, but anyway, uh, while other Ukrainians, particularly in the south and east, condemned him as a fascist, a Nazi collaborator who was, together with his followers, responsible for massacres of Polish and Jewish civilians during the Second World War. And indeed, he was. like He, he was a violent person. He was a, a national you know, you could call him a national freedom fighter or, or uh, ultra nationalist, but within that, there's going to be you know problematic ideologies. And what happened in sort of 1941? So after he'd been sort of around about and already you know showing that he wasn't uh, a big friend of of in this case Polish people and Jews. Uh, in, it was very much an us and them, an in-group where U Ukraine is, is, is the in-group, Ukrainians. So in the spring of 1941, Bandera held meetings with the heads of Germany's intelligence regarding the formation of uh, Nachtigall uh, and Roland battalions. In the spring of that year, the OUN received 2.5 million marks. So that's a, the... Um, organization he was uh, responsible for, received 2.5 million marks for subversive acti activities inside the Soviet Union. So this is where, right, the Soviet Union are our enemies because we want an independent Ukraine. So if if the if Nazi Germany are against them, then let's work with them and we can get these guys out. Uh, but unfortunately, best laid plans of mice and men after Genaglay. So to continue, Gestapo and Adwehr officials protected Bandera's followers as both organizations intended to use them for their own purposes. So this is a case of like three different organizations, OUN of the ultra nationalists in, uh, in Ukraine and the Abwehr and the Gestapo or having, you know, wanting to, to, to see each other or certainly two organizations and the OUN wanting to, to do, to use each other. Right. So it was this kind of you are mutually beneficial relate there are mutually beneficial relationships going on here except you know they go south. So on June the twenty third, nineteen forty one, one day after the German attack on the Soviet Union, Bandera sent a letter to Hitler arguing the case for an independent Ukraine. On the thirtieth of June, nineteen forty one, with the arrival of Nazi troops in Ukraine, Bandera and the OUNB unilaterally declared an independent Ukrainian state. The act of renewal of Ukrainian statehood. The proclamation pledged the cooperation of the new Ukrainian state with Nazi Germany. Germany under the leadership of Hitler with a closing note, glory to the heroic German army and its Fuhrer Adolf Hitler. The declaration was accompanied by violent pogroms. So pogroms are activism against uh, and sort of riots and different movements against particularly Jews. Uh, and and that, that was taking place. I mean, there was a history of that within Ukraine anyway. And uh, yeah, it's feeding into that. So Bandera's expectation that the Nazi regime would post facto recognize an independent fascist Ukraine as an Axis ally proved to be wrong. And then it all went wrong from there. And they didn't agree with each other. And Bandera is thrown into prison by the Nazi. So, you know, if he is this great Nazi, like he was fascistic, but was he a Nazi? Well, no, the Nazis threw him in prison and there he remained. In fact, he was in a concentration camp then uh, and he remained there until the end of the war. So this, and in fact, didn't go back to Ukraine. So the, the, there was an interesting and uh, fraught relationship between Nazi Germany and Bandera. So anyway, his views. American historian, it says at the end here, Timothy Snyder, and I'm going to dip into his work in a second, has described Bandera as a fascist. I think that is, is pretty acceptable. Political scientist Andreas Umland characterized him as a Ukrainian ultra-nationalist. I'd agree with that. And also told Deutsche Welle uh, that he was not a a Nazi, noting that Ukrainian nationalism was not a copy of Nazism. And this is the important part. So he gets called a Nazi because people synonymize Nazi with fascist. And and in common parlance, yeah, that happens all the time. I've done that in the past. But the technical kind of Nazi term, was he a Nazi? No, he wasn't. He was he was not fully aligned with what the Germans wanted because, you know, at the end of the day, the Germans you you had certain villages in um 
and towns in Ukraine that the, the, they were getting invaded by the Soviet Union or invaded by the Germans. Uh, and it's like, and some towns were treated worse by the Soviets, some towns were treated worse by the Germans. And if you're then fighting for, you know, Ukrainian statehood and independence, then neither of these guys are, are good, right? So it, it's, as I say, it's complicated. Historian David Marples described Bandera's view as not untypical of his generation, but as holding quote, an extreme political stance that rejected any form of cooperation with the rulers of Ukrainian territories, kind of what I was saying there, the Poles and the Soviet authorities. So previously, Poland had, uh, you had empires of, of, of Poland, of Lithuania, of, of the Rus, of the Musc Muscovites, you know, Russia effectively. And, you know, uh, out, uh, given all the, that context, here is someone that says, no, we want Ukraine to, to stand on its own two feet. Um, so for Bandera, Russia was a chief advers adversary, but he also lacked tolerance for Poles and Jews. So basically he did a lot of unsavory stuff, and by unsavory I mean morally terrible stuff. But on the other hand, he was also fighting for something that a lot of Ukrainians now would say, well, yeah, that's exactly what we'd want. It's just not the way we'd go about it now. Uh, so you can understand why he's this a complicated figure that evokes maybe contradictory emotions amongst individual people like on the one hand like, yeah i like what he what he stood for here but i don't like him as a moral character and what he did so those kind of things um anyway let's uh, dip into a, a book by um timothy snyder and this is i i advise you to get this but not in where well, you can't you can only get this version in audiobook so he wrote a pamphlet called on tyranny which is fantastic but that's more to do with democratic backsliding in the us uh, but he's then applied that to ukraine he's released it as an audiobook the second half is far longer than the first half so the original pamphlet is really short a quick read or quick audiobook listen but the second part is what you guys would be particularly interested in the on ukraine part is fantastic and it's basically him sitting down and talking it's not actually i don't think he's he's written that he's probably got notes and it's all tidied up uh, uh, from an audio point of view but it's basically him having a chat about how all that applies to ukraine and russia and the war and it, it, he it, he appended that he, he added that on uh, after the war began so it's really really good anyway go and buy the audiobook version where he's reading it himself really good on tyranny and on ukraine so let's dip into in the 1920s and 1930s in poland the mainstream of ukrainian politics was a party which eventually accepted the existence of the polish state a kind of mainstream centrist party but ukrainian nationalism was real um, and ukrainian nationalists did manage to carry out a few assassinations and they did manage to provoke a retribution upon the Ukrainian population, which made them a bit more popular. But in interwar Poland, they never really did amount to much. Ukrainian nationalists from interwar Poland were most prominent and most historically significant during the Second World War, because the Second World War provided the occasion for them to do things they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. This is the idea of, you know, groups of people having mutual benefit to each other there's a utility in this very convenient relationship uh, between them until it all goes wrong ukrainian nationalists in poland for example were generally in favor of a german invasion of eastern europe because they believe that germany could destroy both poland and the soviet union and who else could do that ukrainian nationalists however in 1939 were first greeted not by Germany, but by the Soviet Union. The Second World War in Poland was a matter of Germany invading from the West and the Soviet Union invading almost simultaneously from the East. This meant that Ukrainian nationalists found themselves under Soviet rule, where they went underground. Under Soviet rule, all the other possibilities in Ukrainian politics were wiped out. Either they were banned or the far-left possibilities, which collaborated with the Soviets, were discredited, which left the Ukrainian nationalists, so to speak, alone in the field. Then, there's the idea that, you know, it's particularly prevalent in the west of Ukraine where this is all happening, but you had the Nazi Germans, 
coming in from the west, and then you had Soviet Russians coming in from the sort of north, and then you've got these Ukrainian nationalists left in the middle going, uh, you know, and they do a deal with the Nazis because the Soviets were their main enemy, um, but really when, what they wanted was Ukraine to be their own national, uh, you know, state, their own, their own nation state, uh, and ideally, if, you know, that meant getting rid of the Soviets, but if the Nazis weren't going to play ball and didn't see that as well, then that was an issue for these hyper-nationalists. In 1941, when Germany invades the Soviet Union, what it's actually doing is invading these territories, which the Soviet Union had just invaded. And Ukrainian nationalists now have a chance to support Nazi Germany, which, as they see it, has destroyed Poland and will now destroy the Soviet Union. So there's a good deal of collaboration among active Ukrainian nationalists with the German occupation of Ukraine. And a good number of these people take part in the most horrific of German policies, including pogroms and mass executions of Jews. This collaboration generally comes to an end when it seems like the Germans are losing. And then Ukrainian nationalists, as they wait for the Soviet Union to arrive and defeat the Germans, carry out an ethnic cleansing of Poles in 1943. After that, beginning in 1944, Ukrainian nationalists based in what is now Western Ukraine carry out an insurgency against Soviet power, which lasts for several years and which requires the deportation of about a quarter million people and the death of about another 200,000 people to stop. That's the tradition of Ukrainian nationalism, and that's how it largely comes to an end. It was always a matter of what's now Western Ukraine. It was never very prominent, except in the special conditions of the Second World War, which removed other options, which made its style of politics more normal, and which created possibilities for the kinds of dramatic action which the most extreme of nationalists believed it was right to carry out. It makes you wonder whether, you know, if the Second World War hadn't happened, whether that kind of movement would have gained the the popularity or, or had the effect it, it actually did. It was almost like the Second World War, I mean, the Second World did, did facilitate its prominence. In the Soviet Union, after the Second World War, this tradition obviously didn't have much chance of survival. It was important to some extent in the diaspora, in the United States, in Canada, and elsewhere, but it wasn't the only tradition, as I'm about to talk about. In Ukraine today, the tradition of ethnic nationalism is remarkably understated, especially given that Ukraine has been at war for the last eight years. It's remarkable not just that Ukraine has a Jewish president, but it's remarkable that right-wing nationalists get about 1% to 2% in Ukrainian elections. This is massively important. This is a really common uh, accusation, the, the talk of Ukraine Nazis, the Azov Battalion as somehow being representative of the whole of Ukraine. Uh, BBC News did a really good segment on this at the beginning of the war to say that actually, A, the Azov Battalion isn't what the Russians are claiming it is and has changed over the years. But also, when you look at the makeup of the the political landscape in Ukraine, that kind of politics is far less, has far less prevalence uh, than in most of the rest of Europe. In fact, most people who are attacking Ukraine for the, the, the so-called Nazism that exists there you know, those those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. Actually, they have less uh, far-right representation in Parliament than pretty much most other European nations. So it, it's, it's just incorrect uh, to, to tar. I mean, it's always pretty much in, incorrect to tar entire nations with a single brush. And we must think about that in terms of Russia as well, obviously. But um, But in this case, it really is very wrong. In the West, we have this habit, it's almost a reflex, of looking at Ukraine and trying to find nationalists. And I'll talk later about why this is. But really, we should in general be looking at a mirror. No matter what country we are in, whether it's the United States or pretty much any European country, 
there's far, far more support for extreme nationalism in our countries than there is in Ukraine. Okay, so what I've done there is I've tried to talk about how a tradition of thinking about the nation, which was meant as liberatory, this populism, this romanticism, this social history of Hrushevsky, can become a frustrated ethnic nationalism that under certain conditions can lead people to carry out atrocities and acts of mass murder. That tradition is real. That history is real. I write about it in my books. But it was never, in terms of its numbers of supporters, very significant on the scale of Ukraine. Another tradition always exists side by side so and he goes on to talk about other uh, other things but uh, and this but this is an area that he returns to uh, and and what we'll do is we'll we'll look at someone else that is relevant for this conversation and this someone else is Milena Rudnitska someone again I don't know a huge amount about but who uh, sits not very as a Jew uh, really supporting kind of socialist ideas uh, are culturally socialist and and looking after the poor and needy in the Holodomor uh, famine, the genocide of the Soviet Union. There she was helping those who were starving, gets tarred with the Nazi brush. And she is not that. So where you might look at uh, Bandera and say, oh, there are elements going on there uh, that, that overlap with, with Nazism, you know, quite a lot. Uh, in this case, not at all. And... Uh, you know, Snyder talks talks about that uh, in in chapter eleven, and we'll, we'll dip into that in a second. But it's just this talks to this this really simplistic idea of, of like if you're not with us, you're against us, and if you're against us, you're a Nazi, and it's that simple. And of course, that is just wholly uh, in, inappropriate and in, incorrect. This is not good enough. And so when people do that in the threads below. It's not good enough. You you should be better than that. If you're going to come to my threads and argue that point of view, you know, jog on because that's simplistic, naive, and, and just a little bit stupid. Anyway, let's go to Snyder to talk about uh, this possibly quite remarkable woman. I don't know too much about her. Um, uh, over to Snyder. But maybe, and I'm still waiting for her biography. Maybe the most interesting of the children was actually Milena, the feminist and the parliamentarian. Milena had the distinction, something that we'll talk about again before this is all over. She had the distinction that as she tried to speak out for Ukrainians in need, she was called a Nazi. In the 1930s, in 1932 and 1933, there was a terrible famine in Soviet Ukraine which we'll be speaking about again. And Milena Rudnitska was one of the people, in fact, the leading person, who tried to draw the attention of Europeans to this famine. But anyone, including Milena, despite the fact that she was a Democrat and that she came from a Jewish family, none of that mattered, anyone who tried to draw attention to the famine was called by the Soviet regime a Nazi. The argument was made that if you are criticizing the Soviet regime in any respect at all, you must be on the side of the Germans. And since Hitler has come to power in Germany, that means you are a Nazi. This is the rhetoric that, that I'm talking about and Snyder talks about as well. And, it just, just, and this is what we see. This is what we see from Russian voices on my threads. And yes, I'm having to go at them. This is what we see from the Kremlin. This is what we see from propagandists. It's Ukro Nazis, Banderites, Nazis. Well, hang on. Have you got any nuance here? What, what are, you, are you calling? Like, I am a super liberal philosopher, right? I am, I, I'm arguably closer to, you know, Soviet communism than I am to uh, Nazism and fascism. Right, it gets a bit complicated, but but it, you know it's a bit all over the shop when you you look at a, a political compass. But th I have been called by people on in the threads below. I am regularly called a Ukraine Nazi, a Nazi philosopher, and a Banderite, and I'm like utterly not those things. I'm just not, and and but this is the simplistic, uh, qua stupid. Uh, approach of these sorts of people, which is like tarring 
all sorts of people with the same brush and all sorts of people is anyone who doesn't think like I am. But those people who are accusing me of this, and in this case, you know, we've we've got this woman that we're talking about here, uh, well, actually, no, not so much then. They probably were more of your, your you know, very communist people. But people who, who accuse me and others of, uh, and Ukrainians of being Ukraine-Nazis are often more fascistic themselves. Putin, I would argue, is a fascist, is an authoritarian fascist now. Uh, and I would argue many of the people who support his his ideology are fascistic. Look at what's going on culturally in, in Russia at the moment. Uh, look at what their approach is to, to us and them and so on and so forth. And, and uh, you look at the work of Jason Stanley and see whether those 10 pillars of fascism are being uh, erected by Putin and those in the Kremlin and those around him. When people tried to gather aid for Ukrainians during this famine, the Soviet Union rejected it and referred to these efforts to get aid to starving people as Hitler help, as though the impulse to try to rescue the dying somehow made you a Nazi. We'll return to this, but it's an element of Milena's career, which helps us to understand a certain rhetorical tradition in which we still find ourselves as we confront this war. Milena was interested. And that, that's a rhetorical question I'm talking about. I don't really need to go too much further into her details. She is an interesting person to look at. Uh, her her life and career certainly makes for interesting reading, and I, I would I would advise anyone to to do so. But I, I'm more interested in that rhetorical tradition that he's talking about there, and this this propensity for simple oversimplifying uh, narratives into us and them, and you know, in this case. Well, you can black and white, or communist and and fascist, and and then the confusion that actually some of those people that are now kind of advocating for those rose that 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 kind of mythological greatness of communist Soviet Union are themselves actually fascists now, and throwing around terms like Nazis and so on and so forth. It's just it's just a whole hot mess. Uh, and I just wanted to kind of have a little talk about that, see what you think. Here are two two examples of people who have been called Nazis and myself as well uh, by by Russians uh, in the past and in the present. And it's it's all about you know labeling people to dismiss them with a label rather than having to deal with actually what were the ideas that they were that they are putting forward. Uh, you know, if you are going to call me like a Nazi or Ukraine Nazi or whatever, then you need to come with some receipts to, to actually, you know, present to me the rationale that I am those words, that I am that label. And in the case of support, I mean, what happens is if you support Ukraine, you are therefore a Nazi because all Ukrainians are Nazis because them wanting their own national identity is Nazism. And it is because Bandera wanted to that and he worked with the Nazis. And so therefore he was a Nazi. And therefore anyone who also wants Ukrainian nationhood and uh, Ukrainian independence is a Nazi too. Because really the whole country is just some vassal state of the Russian Federation, of the Soviet Union, of whatever you want to call it. And this is a kind of simplistic thinking that we see, simplistic thinking that people in the threads who who are you know, doing their normal bot activity or people in the Kremlin um, and uh, Putin uh, particularly. Anyway, uh, let me know if you found that interesting uh, and let me know what your thoughts are. I am no expert on either of these people. Uh, so if I've if I've got any of the details wrong, let me know. But uh, I I would advise you to go and get Timothy Snyder's audio book. There, it is fantastic. And um, until next time, thanks so much, and appreciate the support. Take care.